Uh, welcome to the Town of Deerfield uh, Select Board Board of Health meeting for June 30th, uh, 2021. It is 6.02 p.m. This meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation in accordance with the Governor Baker's June 16th, 2021 Act extending certain provisions of COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, including an extension of remote participation provisions of his March 20th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, general law chapter 30A section 20. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technical problems interrupt the virtual broadcasts unless otherwise um, required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in a specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. For purposes of in-person attendance, the town of Deerfield will host the meeting in the main meeting room of South Deer of Deerfield Municipal Offices with remote participation on details below. So there's a dial-in number if you're watching at home of 312-626-6799. Uh, the meeting ID is 911-604-1580, and the passcode is seven. Uh, excuse me, five seven zero zero one two. If you go to the town website, you can uh, go to the bottom right corner where our calendar is, and you'll see this this meeting uh, listed. And if you click on that link, you'll find a link to the Zoom, and here you'll be joining us via Zoom. So I'll call the meeting to order. Thank you, David. Um, I would like to request that everybody in the audience uh, keep the noise to a minimum because the, all the microphones are picking up the noise and it causes a, a lot of dis, uh, distortion in what our discussions are. Um, and as chair, I'm also declaring this evening that we will not have any public discussion uh, on uh, for this evening. Okay. Okay, the first uh, scheduled hearing is for the host community agreement. Can you hear me, Trevor? Yes, yes, I can. So uh, we've, we're, um, I think, welcoming Ken Buquellen here. He um, wants to discuss a um, community, a host community agreement for Deerfield Cultivation Campus. Um, Ken, welcome. You're also attending on Zoom. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Glad to be here with you guys. So, Thank you. so um, I guess uh, for the audience, I, I've met you before, and uh, just for the audience, tell I guess tell everybody what you're hoping to do and uh, bring to Deerfield. So, um, so my wife and I, born and raised in uh, Connecticut, so we're from New England. We came out here. We're in Seattle now. We came out here three and a half years ago. Um, we built a licensed cannabis facility here. Um, research facility and a production facility um, and we're ready to come back now um, back to New England um, so we're looking we've we've searched around quite a bit we found a piece of property in your town um, that is in the green zone um, approved for growing and cultivation dispensary um, so we're really looking forward to coming back and building a facility there um, I've provided a <laughs> I provided a little bit of a um, proposal that explains um, our vision, our experience, and what we're looking to do. And we're hoping that um, we can join your town and be part of your community. Thank you. Um, do we want to, uh, I'm just trying to find that. Do we want to share that for the might, yeah, public? Yeah, put this up. Yes, I'm going to just try, here's the packet. Let me just see if I can do that and share that for everybody. I think I can. Uh, this is across from Treehouse. Correct. Okay. Open this here. Bear with me a sec. Well, some of it will be sideways, so let's, let's see. Uh, Do you want I, me to try, Trevor? Uh, shh, Wait, sec. can you see it? Oh, it's yeah, just sideways. Go. Yep. Uh, thank you. You're already uh, open the gun. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, um, there you go. Uh, can just move it down right to the yeah that slide that has the layout. Yep, up a little bit. Yeah, there you it's, go. It's the third one down. Oh, you mean the slide? Keep going. Keep going. With the layout, 
There you that go. One there? That, yeah, that okay. one. Okay. I guess just to orient people, this is um, kind of across from Treehouse um, and south towards the fire station a little bit, but opposite of the fire station. Um, I guess what you see in the top portion is the on ramp for 91 North off of 116. And um, this uh, this proposes a, an entryway in with a dispensary uh, and a um, laboratory for testing. I guess uh, dispensary would be D, uh, E would be the laboratory, and C would be cultivation. And I think a, buildings A and B towards the back would be for future expansion of cultivation, if I have that right, Ken. The property is 20, 28 acres. Um, we'll only be using about maybe six or seven acres. We'll leave most of it treed and wooded. And we'd like to make some trails and stuff, um, walking trails, but most of it will just be open, left as treed open land. So obviously there's, there's quite a bit of work to do with the, um, you know, zoning, planning boards, uh, site plan review, all of that. I think this is just kind of a first introduction to Deerfield. And um, I, I don't know if you've held a public um kind of presentation yet have you ken i don't i know that at one point you were thinking of doing that in june but i don't know if that happened yet yeah so um i think my attorney tara hopper is on here so um we we've spoke a little bit about this and we feel that the um we we'd like to get the hca agreement done and then take it to the public because uh, that's just sort of the way that the ccc sort of likes it done um so that's, we'd just like to follow those, uh, you know, that, that schedule if possible. You know, if we could first do the HCA, come into agreement, everyone agrees and signs, and then we can take it to the public for questions and, and see what the public has to say. That sounds fine. So um, I think, as you know, we the Deerfield already has two um, community host agreements um, with two different developers or people who are planning to develop in town and we're uh, have been waiting quite a while I mean it's a long process to get something like this going um, and so we uh, I think our intention was to was to kind of use that same uh, host agreement and I believe that you had some communication back with the town that you, you were hoping to change that a little bit so um, Maybe you could speak a little bit about what your request is, and then we could, you know, take it under advisement. Yeah, I spoke to Casey about it. Um, one of one of them was just small. I took talked to the guy at the uh, the water department too. So there was some language in there and said that we would purchase the water and the sewer from the city. Um, in this case, there's no water main at this property, so. He said it would be all right if we drilled wells, and then we'll put a lift station with a meter, and we can use the city sewer, but we'll um, we'll be using wells for the water. Mm -hmm. So that was just a little bit of language, just that goes along with the land and just the fact that there's no um, water main. And then the other was just um, we were just discussing the 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 taxes, the you know the fee from the town. Um, but I think that's, I think that's going to be more for my lawyer and the town lawyer to discuss those final numbers. Okay. I, I think it's really important that we remain consistent. Um, if you want to discuss something else, that's okay. Um, and we would be glad to talk to you about it, but, um, I, f I feel pretty strongly that we should be consistent in what we're asking for. Um, so, yeah. So I was to make a proposal and we'll, we'll yeah. take a look at that, how it compares to the other, other agreements. Um, David, Casey has her hand up. Yeah. Okay. Casey. Might I make a suggestion to the select board that Ken and I work through that with council and then bring a more finalized agreement to the select board. Right. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Just, Sounds good. um, That's if you can dig answer. out. If you, the reason why I'm asking to be consistent is because we justified our fees um, based on what we felt um, was going to be required from the community and what we felt was a fair give back to the community. So if you could dig those out, um, that 
you know, that discussion is really important. It's been a while, but, you know, we did, we did put a lot of time into that. And I've had that conversation with council and with Ken. Okay. okay. So we'll proceed with uh, yeah. under that direction. Thank you, Carol. Okay. I think it's a, you know, it's, it's a large project for Deerfield. So I think it looks like a, you know, it's a large growth facility and, and, um, and, and laboratory. Um, yeah, I think we had changed, the town changed their zoning bylaws to allow it in this, this section, I think about a year ago. Um, so, you know, that parcel has been empty for, for quite a while, obviously. Um, so we'll, we'll see, I think it'd be a good, uh, um, it'll bring a lot of jobs to the town and uh, some revenue that's needed. So we'll see how the process goes. Any, anything else you wanna add, Ken? Um, just a couple things. So um, that building E there um, is a third party testing lab. Um, yep. There's a company here called Confidence Analytics. They're an ISO accredited lab. Um, they operate um, in Washington State and California. And uh, if, if this HCA is approved um, for this project, they'll be coming forward with a looking for a host community agreement with you guys too. Um, so that's a third party testing lab. Um, and they'll bring probably 40 or 50 pretty good paying jobs to the area. And what this facility would do would be go and grab samples around the state and do their third parties testing for the CCC and all the regulations. Um, very um, well known, um, highly credible company working in two states right now. Um, so that's a good thing for the project, I feel. Um, and it brings you know some good jobs to the town. Um, also, we just we really like this location. We've looked around at a bunch of towns and tried to work with a few other towns. Um, we like the location. My wife and I have been coming to this town for years, um, so on vacation, sometimes yeah. passing through. So we really like it, and we just hope that uh, we can find a way to work together and build this project. We're looking forward to coming back to New England. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ken, have you opened any discussions with the uh, cannabis control? Yeah. No, it's not. It's not time. The first thing we need to do is um, so, so. Just to give you guys a little background, um, I own another company called Adaptive Grow Technologies, and we build large-scale facilities um, nationwide. And I'm building a few facilities right now, large ones for other clients in Massachusetts. So I'm pretty familiar with the entire process with the CCC, architectural review, special permits. I do this stuff every day, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Okay. Great. Very good. It's helpful. Because I know that's been a stumbling block that we've run into quite a bit. Yeah. The, the, the first thing that we really need to do, in my opinion, is come to an agreement and that you guys um, like the project. Um, you feel it's a good project for your town and your community. And once we come to that agreement, then we can move along on the other steps. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yep. Good to see you again. Thank you for accepting the proposal, everyone. Look forward to talking in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. So what would our next step be? Our next step will be, uh, I think he, he will, uh, he and his attorney will present something to Casey. Casey will talk with Lisa and then present to the board okay. um, a proposed host community agreement. We'll see where we go from there. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next thing on our agenda for this evening is the Senior Housing Ad Hoc Committee. On time, even. <laughs> Welcome. So, Just state your name for everybody. And... Can everybody hear me? Uh, I, I pull that forward a little bit. Just like sometimes you got to speak right into it to catch the speakers. Oh, right. <laughs> Can, we have some... Can everybody hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank Excellent. you. Okay. Um, I am Lily Dwight. I am chair of the Can ad hoc. Oh, I guess we, I guess we couldn't all hear you then. Okay. Um, <laughs> Maybe yell. So I can, I can speak <clears throat> to the room and the microphone. Yeah. Can you hear me if I speak like this? I think you got to just lean right in. <clears throat> there you go. Hello. Yes. All right. Can you Better. hear me in the back of the room? Yes. yes. Excellent. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lily Dwight. I'm the chair of the ad hoc committee for senior housing in Deerfield. 
And um, as this is our very first official meeting with the select board, um, I thought what I would like to do um, is introduce the committee because um, I've attended a number of meetings recently where women on the committee's credentials have been questioned. So I really wanna let everybody know who we are and why we're in our inspiration for doing this. Great. And because I am myself, we're gonna go in reverse alphabetical order. Um, <laughs> I would like to introduce Annalie Wolfkuhl, who you all know as the chair of the planning board. Annalie is the former CEO of Hospice Care of Rhode Island, a $27 million home hospice with over 400 employees and 400 volunteers that she managed. She was responsible for developing housing and services for hospice care for her agency in the entire state of Rhode Island. Um, next up is Deborah Darling Raphael, who is not here tonight. Uh, she is a realtor, and Deborah's been challenged by some COVID problems. Um, but when she attends, she's awesome. And as you can imagine, when we're talking about property, she yes. is very helpful. Uh, next alphabetically is Carolyn Shores Ness, whose credentials need no introduction, except to say that she started working on this with me over 20 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's myself. Um, I have been a chief information officer or a chief technology officer in the field of aging for over 20 years. I've been responsible for multi-million dollar budgets for technology and housing services and pharmacy for long-term care in Illinois. Colorado, California, and Massachusetts. Um, I have been awarded three patents for my work, and my most recent one was in December. Congratulations. So we're a bunch of nerds. <laughs> okay, Great. so that said, it sort of actually explains what happened. When we first met, we all agreed that it made sense to explore town property first to both um, speed up the process and reduce the cost. And so, um, Jennifer, if you could share that first one the, with all the spreadsheet stuff. So I called the assessor's office, who are very helpful, and they turned me on to Fund with Maps, the GIS. And um, here we go. The spreadsheet one. If not, I yeah. can. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yep. Um, no, okay, not that one. The spreadsheet. Just a couple, couple more down. Okay. One more. Here we go. Okay, yep. actually, you can go up to the first picture. Up, go back one page. There we go. I think. So, in doing a search for properties owned by the town of Deerfield, these are the number of blue dots that came up, and we went, "Holy mackerel, Andy!" Yeah. Because everything owned by this town is not revenue generating, right? Right. Um, so we decided to explore. Okay, next page, please, Jen. Thank you. So we spent a great deal of time. We meet every week as working meetings because um, it's so hard to get stuff done in between. So we were meeting every week and we're actually been exploring and drilling down on all the different properties. There are over 253 acres that are owned by the town that are not town hall, elementary school, or any of the easily identifiable properties. And we were, there's some really weirdos in there. But um, <laughs> so we started thinking about, um, Carolyn had heard about a program um, in some town in one of her seminars about using carbon offsets where you take forested land and they'll pay you to leave it forested. Right. Um, there is a lot of land up here around uh, Old Time Nook. I mean, actually, uh, can you scroll the other way, Jen? Please. I think, yeah, keep going. And here we go. So this is um, all land here that is very contiguous to each other as well as we might hear the uh, uh, Connecticut River Greenway as well. So there appear to be something along the line, like 70 acres, maybe more, that could be, could be used to bundle together for carbon offsets and be a revenue generator 
for the town. Uh, a lot of that property is bordered by the Allen Chase Trust, which is uh, Eagle, Brook Eagle Brook as well. So there may be opportunity there to partner with them and get a big old chunk of revenue. We don't know anything about this. And so we wanted to bring this to you and see if maybe it could be handed off to the energy committee. Mm -hmm. And we would be happy to, you know, hand it off to them, give them all the information that we have as well. But this seemed like a great opportunity to generate some income. A lot of that land, as you know, up around Pine Nook is, uh, it's gullies and hillsides and stuff. So probably not very developable, but I, I don't know about that. Yeah. Um, and then there is a lot of other acreage that are these weirdo bits um, that have a butters who may very well be interested in buying that. Or um, just if we can get it on the tax rolls, if we can even get a hundred of those acres back on the tax rolls, that would be revenue for the town. Mm -hmm. um, if you could scroll again, Jim. And you can see there's also, uh, this I'll get to later in the other part of the presentation, but there's a fair amount of blue dots in the center of town as well. And one more scrolling. This page is the property that is owned by unknown. Um, unknown takes work because somebody's going to have to chase it down. But there may be, it looked to us in looking through it that there is probably property in there that people think they own um, that they don't realize they're not being assessed for. And so there could be, if, there, if a committee could be put together to pursue these different land parcels by following up with the butters, et cetera, it would be a real possible revenue generator for the town, which is not what you expect to get from senior housing. <laughs> I just want to know. <laughs> um, and with that in mind, uh, senior housing would dearly love to put in that should revenue be generated from carbon offsets um, and or getting this stuff on the tax rolls that some small portion be set aside for the future maintenance of senior housing because senior housing when we get it going you notice i don't say if but when we get it going um, we will be funded for the capital investment and the initial building etc but we are going to need to maintain it as well so we would love to put in uh, a plea for that i if it makes life too difficult i understand but it's worth a shot right yep nothing ventured nothing gained okay so um that has been an entirely strange offshoot of senior housing but along the way we've had an awful lot of conversations um so I guess it's just as easy not to do the presentation, but to go through the slides that are up here. So Jen, can you go back to that first? Yeah. Oh, you go down, down, yeah, they know who. So um, one of the things that we realize we really want feedback from the select board and ultimately the community is what is our job? Right? What is, what is it we are trying to do? And we need to be able to say that in one sentence. So we came up with, we want to rehome as many older adults of Deerfield as we can. Now, mind you, those are adults who want to be rehomed and that we should probably put that in there. Um, but that is our goal. And um, Assuming that you all agree that that is our job, we can continue with the presentation. If not, we need to be schooled. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yes, it does. Okay. It does? Okay, great. Thank you. So how are we going to do this? Well, um, first of all, we want to identify sites that will match the criteria, and I'll go into the criteria shortly. Um, we need to identify funding routes. I have been attending a lot of mass housing webinars over the last couple of months. There are um, 
a variety of options, housing trusts. There's a program called Mass 40R, which um, will support subsidized housing as well. We need to identify building and service partners because it's not enough to put up a building. People who live in it need services. Um, and we obviously need community input because this is all about building it for the community. Does that make sense? Are there, yeah. and please, so we're making this presentation because we want you to say, uh, and what about, right? If you've sure. got something yep. or you disagree. Yeah. One of the things that has come up in the past that has put kind of a hold on things is when we went with subsidized uh, housing, uh, the criteria was that we could only earmark maybe 10% of the housing for Deerfield residents and the rest of it had to be open. Is that what you're finding as well? We have not, oh, so I don't know um, if everybody could hear Mr. Wolfram, yeah, but that they, in, okay, so um, we have not explored the funding stuff yet okay. um, because we, we need to understand a few things beforehand like uh, how much land are we bringing to the table? We did get the CPC funding, so that's enormously helpful. And I think bringing that to the table as well is going to be good. Um, we may want to go for a mass 40R overlay, which will have a different ramification. We may want to create a housing trust. Um, housing trusts are actually getting funded through the American Recovery Program Act as well right now. Um, so there, um, we don't, I'm trying to speak to Mr. Wolfram as well. <laughs> we're, we're not, we have not explored the funding options yet. Um, right now, we just want to make sure that we are identifying everything we need to do. I, I think is we're not, we haven't d decided on anything, but we are listing them and, yes. and collecting information. So we are looking actively for partners, both pri private and public, um, but we haven't, I mean, we haven't determined who's what, what route we're going to do yet. Of course, I think it. I think it does take a lot of work to kind of figure out what what do we have for property in town. Is any of it suitable? I'm sure, some of it is, some of it's not. And I'm glad you kind of did a holistic look at the properties and see what what can we do with the other ones and the carbon sequestration uh, is a good idea. Yeah. Uh, and then also, um, you know, we have we have a great example right next door in Sunderland who is building a wonderful senior housing facility and has a partner. So, I, you know, I know um, Tom, I'm sure would be willing to work with us and talk about, you know, their experience, exactly. how they've done that. And um, who their partners are, because yes. they could be our partners. They could yes. be, they could be interested in, you know, being so close, you know, yeah. they, they may want to uh, partner with us as well. So. Absolutely. Um, I don't think, I mean, to Mr. Wolfram's point, the question of, be reserving it for Deerfield residents. I I don't know that that's going to be legal anywhere. Right. But yeah. if we um, can put together some sort of a program where we're trying to keep farming going, and if you're a farmer and you put your land in APR, you get a preference to come into the housing or something like that, we can figure out creative ways mm. to um, yep. give preferential treatment, I guess. Yeah. There are ways. There are ways. Yeah, um, we're just, we'll I, I be mean, creative. Yeah, <laughs> you just you have to you have to compile all the information yes. and what other communities have done to achieve that. Yes, and it's been um, in a lot of these seminars. They are very urban environments, um, talking about what they've done to get stuff done for subsidized housing for older adults and other um, other members of the community, subsidized housing generally. And so you need to weed through what is actually applicable to us and what brings us as much value in return. Um, anything else about other things of we, that you feel we should be making sure we put in our how? I think that ca hey. captures quite a bit of it. Yeah. yeah. It's good. Onwards, Jen. Thank you. I should go ding. <laughs> um, so we talked about what are the principles? What are the overarching principles of the housing environment that we think should be created? And this is a really important part to make sure that you all are 
that we're aligned with the way that you guys think that we should be going. Um, that we need subsidized affordable senior housing, not market value pricing. Because if you look at the Snowberry homes, those are older adults, you know, affordable housing, but that's not there going needs, to meet the right. needs of right. our older adults, many of them. And that we do not want to create a ghetto. We believe, we see, we know that the older adults in our community are a vital piece of actually how this town runs, right? Of course. Um, and we want to keep it that way. And we want our children and grandchildren to get the benefit of the presence of people of all generations, as well as vice versa. Although we do recognize that older adults need a break too. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, so those basically were two big ones, but we also started talking so that we would like to see it be an intergenerational kind of physical setup. Mm. Um, it should be walkable. It should be sociable. In other words, it should create abilities to the ability to socialize and not isolate people. It needs to be accessible, clearly, but accessible not not just for um, people in wheelchairs, but accessible. Um, I don't know how to say it, mentally as well through design, inviting, mm -hmm. and accessible. And especially for our community, we felt that the outdoors should be as much a part of the design as the indoors. I think that's really important to anybody who's lived here all their lives that they don't want to go and live in a box. Right. Um, so these were the principles that we have come up with. Are there others? Or I, I, mean, I really like the inter generational i mean because that's really important that you know um generations need to live together and they learn from each other and support each other and it's really um so i, I like that a lot that it's you know that it, that's based on uh surveys people wanted small number of units mm. in neighborhood settings so there was no Versus um, like a large, large right. sprawl. Well, just a large, or even huge a building lock, which mm -hmm. yeah. probably wouldn't do in Deerfield anyway, but that would certainly be yeah. the least expensive to build. It's but, true. Yeah. Right. I mean, the more you can think, make things dense but and people vertical, were clear, it's a lot less money. People were clear they wanted exactly. small, right. multifamily kind of you know housing units right. placed and so in that's, neighborhoods. That's why it's a, it's a challenge, because it is also a trade-off then in, in cost and right. sighting as well, yeah. right? Yeah. And also if our job one is to rehome as many older adults as we can, so these are all different tensions mm. that are pulling on the idea. But if we're all in agreement that these are the principles that we should be using, then they'll help as we wrestle with the actual physical manifestation when it comes time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. And these are the criteria. These criteria were developed through surveys that were done specifically on senior housing 15 years ago. I'm looking for Sharon Pachor. <laughs> um, maybe longer. Um, but also other ones as well that have happened along, like the housing plan um, did some surveys on this stuff as well. And it also comes from a lot of conversations in the community. And uh, we identified that it should be walkable to banking, faith communities, the library, market, medical, outdoor recreation. Oh, this is alphabetical, not priority. Okay. okay. Uh, yep. Pharmacy, police, public transportation, restaurants and bars, a senior slash community center, because that could be the intergenerational bit, um, town hall. And we clearly need access to emergency medical services, public transportation, and I think sewer. That, I mean, depending on the size of the thing, just sort of figured better to put it in there as an expectation. Yeah. Sorry, Trevor. <laughs> no, I, more users, the better. Yeah. Um, and so are there other criteria that, that we might have missed? Well, I'm, I'm glad you have the outdoor recreation. I, th I think the setting and being able to get, as you, as you had earlier on, just designing much of it to be outside and people to be able to have exercise and then space to walk and, you know, access to different areas. And that um, is who we are. It is. Right? 
Yep. And so we, we're not trying to build something that you would have in Boston or right. Malden. We're right. trying to build something in Deerfield. Yep. Okay. No, so the next. Only, the only thing I might add to that. Emily, yes. Schools. What was that? Is what? Schools. Oh, schools. Oh, good point. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Because I know as a child, my early part of education at Deerfield was from my grandmother, my two grandmothers that raised me. Uh, and it was just, you know, it was very. No, I agree. And, 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 That's. Yeah, excellent point. It will be added to the list. Thank you. All right, next slide, please. So these are some of the insights that we have that um, we've come up with from our work that the town owns significant acreage and we should not need to buy land. Long time veteran of the US government still seem well, to want to sidestep this. Can we mute that somewhere? <laughs> wow. Somebody? Uh, Hold on a second. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I can't see who's doing it when I'm sharing my screen. Yes. Thank you, Jen. Um, so that the, the idea is that we've identified a lot of acreage, and so we should not need to buy land. It doesn't mean that we currently necessarily own a site, but maybe we can affect a swap or in moving some of the untaxed land onto taxable revenues, the selling it to somebody, we could use that to purchase uh, land. I just, it just seems crazy to buy more land, mm -hmm. frankly. There's over 300 acres identified right now. Okay, so um, then the other thing is with those criteria, so there's, we're revisiting all the blue dots and look at, yes, exactly, that is our plan center. And we own a lot of land in our town center, and some of it we're sitting on right now. Um, yes. <laughs> so could you go to the next one, Jen? So we, we are drilling down a little bit, and this this is these are the blue dots that um, we currently have in the center of town. We really believe that we need to place this housing in the center of town because when we do, we meet all of the criteria, including the schools, by the way, right? Because in the mm -hmm. center of town. Right. So um, this, is, this is as far as we have gotten and we didn't want to go any further because it's really important to make sure that we are on the track that you, you all want us to be on. I feel like it, you are. I mean, it makes sense to me that, you know, I've always thought about this space that we're in right now uh, if we decide to do something else with a town hall, um, you know, we have this, the senior center building and the church all right next to the library, right next to the schools, right in the center of town. So, um, you know, again, a big investment to do all of those, those items, but right. um, it's worth, you know, exploring if that's a possibility right here. Um, I know that Brayburn was, was donated to the town or somehow, acquired by the town years ago but there's no real access to that right. unless we had you know access through um, a street a house on main street that came up for sale again purchasing property but um you know I don't... well and also um one of the reasons we felt it was important to come and check in with you all was when we got to here is that we know that there's um, a large effort going into reimagining the town center. Yep. And yep. we want to see senior housing as a significant piece of that reimagining. Yep. So we would love to, um, under your direction, do we have like a big old meeting with all the Imagineering um, committees and then clearly we need community input yep. and that kind of stuff. But I do think that senior housing should be, well, for our perspective, it should be the heart of the project, but, um, <laughs> but why not? So. Yeah. Sure. No, I agree. Uh, yeah, we, we definitely uh, would love to have you at the table as we're looking at different ways to, to make 
you know, revitalize downtown and figure out what we're going to do with these aging buildings. And our acres and acres of land. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, Wonderful. Well, thank you. We just yeah. wanted to give you that update. And we That's also great. wanted to, um, we need a little direction on what our next steps should be. And, and I think um, that getting together with the other committees that are working on the reimagining of the town center, maybe that's it. I, I don't know. What do you think? What are your thoughts, Carolyn? I mean, well, I, I, I'm, I feel like it's not a waste of money to have someone come in like a landscape architect and help us try to reimagine what is happening down here. We have all, we own the whole square here now um, with the donation of the church. And I, you know, part town meeting approved a building assessment, um, you know, money. So we should look at what the needs are for the seniors. We're, we're moving forward on that immediately. Um, and then we need to look at the buildings. What do we have? What is rehabable and what is not? How do we match up our needs to the space that is rehabable or not? Right. And then I, you know, I mean, we had always talked about a walking track around here that backs up to the senior center and goes in a circle behind the library. And but we oh, have the library the project too, we, and down yeah. to the Chesley. We have the library right. project that is moving forward, but you know uh, the state donation is capped at four million dollars. Well, you know some of the pricing because of the pandemic. Now you know it, the project is you know jumped up, and it could be as high as twelve million. So is it really worth applying for that money? Maybe we should do something on our own so that we can build a community center in our library yeah. with our own money. If we're only going to get $4 million, it's no different than the roof project. We had to put a lot of effort into that, a lot of donations just to get the roof done at the elementary school. And we could have done it cheaper, I think. And Kippy can back me up. Um, if by ourselves, you that. have to go through all these hoops to get, you know, state money. And when the project was in the seven to eight million dollar range, four million dollars was very attractive. But now that the same project, you know, maybe has jumped up. I think we need to look at it and say, what can we do on our own without jumping through hoops? And that would be part of and then incorporate it into the, what we want to do as in the whole area. We have to think we have not enough dollars. That's very clear. So how do we do sustainable work for our community on these projects that we can afford moving forward? We have needs. There's no questions there are needs. We've been working on senior housing for 20 years. And how many times have we gotten almost to the door of having projects done and then they fall through? It's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. But... You know, maybe if we look at the big picture and spend a little bit of money on a, on a big picture planning where people really come and contribute their ideas. I mean, we had um, before the pandemic, February 29th, 20, I mean, um, Last year, we had the, you know, our big climate change and we had a charrette afterwards on right, the downtown that was wonderful. Yeah, and that was it was, everybody's ideas were so fantastic and it was very exciting and, and, and they were very consistent, even though there was a, a huge different groups of people involved. So I think um, we just need to have public input. We need to have somebody that will facilitate it that has some skill in imagination and that can take people's ideas. And I mean, we have money available through um, the ARPA money coming to us that is based for economic development. So I, you know, my feeling as we've not really discussed it, but you know, we want to develop the Leary lot. They have new owners at um, mm -hmm. at Leader Lumber that want a little bit of slice that will give us 50 foot um, frontage off to May, uh, May, uh, Elm Street so we can have a, a real good parking lot in and out and we can make it be very attractive and, and use it to support Berkshire Brewing and expansion of downtown economic activity. Um, and that could be part of the envisioning of, of the whole area. And But I think you know, it's clear everyone wants walkability, sociability downstairs, down here, and they want a vital downtown. So anything that we can support um, good services, local services downtown, I think is what we have to do. 
And I, think I mean, so we're making an effort to make it more resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the tree boxes are going up to take water, storm water to, for, you know, we have to look forward. What, what are we going to be faced in, in 30 or 40 years? And that's part of it. You know, yes. resiliency is usually considered part of recovery, but in reality, resiliency is part of the future, creating a future. So what we need to do is what are we going to do for downtown? We are flood prone. We are, um, you know, we're at the bottom of the bowl. I've been saying that for years. Everyone is sick of me saying that, but the water table has changed. When I was on the planning board in the 80s and 90s, it was a good foot foot and a half lower than it is now. This is a tremendous impact to us. And if it continues on that, yes, we don't have co coastal, you know, seawater level <laughs> raising, but we certainly have a water table that's raising. Yeah. And we need to figure out what we're doing with our stormwater. What are we doing for our development? And um, I think, you know, when Kip and, um, uh, when Kip and Roger Sadowski were on the board a couple of years ago, when we were under the, and we did the MVP program, we started that process of, in the last three or four years. We started looking at the, um, you know, changing in zoning. That started the process and, um, you know, we've moved forward with that and, and the town meeting went forward and supported really good, resilient, um, progressive kind of, you um, site plan review that will help us develop, create a future that will make Deerfield desirable to live here. And I think that will be part of preserving the downtown. You know, what are we doing downtown to make that enhance what's yeah. happening? Okay. So, um, and senior housing, I just because yes, that's senior my, housing my will be part of the mix. It, it should be um, certainly at the heart of that as well. Right, and that's- because Older adults right. bring economic benefits, we spend money and we don't cost money. And you know, so I'm saying we, because I didn't start off with all this gray here when I started, but um, we use services, but we don't go to school, right? And so we are excellent neighbors and we love vital communities and that's, we wanna stay in our home community. So um, it seems to me that the next steps would be that we would well, ask if, if I have we could a, make a date. Yeah, I have a meeting. Um, I'm, I'm working on putting a meeting together with Berkshire Design to look at the common, you know, finish up that, that work there and um, kind of expand out to see where, you know, right. where we go from there to got, kind of get a master kind of vision of what we're doing downtown. So. I'd certainly be happy to invite you to that when I, I get that, that. Yeah, I think that's squared that away be. and then have more of a formal meeting. I think we're just going to set up a quick, quick get together, but um, it makes sense to have a, a more a formal meeting, meeting, a working yeah. meeting to kind of get, get an idea of where we can um, tie all these interests together as we're starting that plan. Excellent. And in the meantime, our committee will continue to do our working meetings. I think that we're going to start exploring um, funding a bit because that, as you know, is very complicated. Yep, for sure. Great. So well, thank you for all your hard work. In a nutshell. I appreciate it very much. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Lynn. you on your work. It's some of the best work I've seen and a, a very good foundation for the start of senior housing in this town. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next thing on our agenda. Uh, continue class two dealers license for K dog auto sales. So this this was a continuation from um, earlier in the month, right? We were looking at yes. whether we wanted to um, extend a class two license in, in a residential area on River Road. That's correct. Um, I have to go back a few meetings and maybe another book. It's been. Um, Kevin, were you able to put together um, the agreement with um, a repair garage? Um, I think you're muted. Uh, I unmuted you. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm still working on that. I've spoken with them twice. It's just trying to sit down with the owner. And he also does the work at the garage. I spoke with his secretary today. I was okay. trying to get it for the meeting. Thoughts, yeah, anybody? I, uh, 
I have to say that I'm actually against having the class two license in that residential area. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate. There's other areas in town. I can barely hear you. I'm, I'm opposed to that. Uh, and I don't think it's appropriate area for a class two license. But there's other areas in town that you could do it, uh, but that is not one of them. There, there's not going to be a use of the property for that. Well, I don't think it should be where on that property on River Road. Nothing physically or visibly is going to change. So I'm, I'm a little confused by that. But we, we would be giving a class two license to that property. And that's right. So in and fact, right. I understand your model of business wouldn't be changing, but we would be uh, changing how we how we see and where we would put, you know, dealerships, car dealerships. So I, I'm not I'm also not in favor of putting it in a residential area. And I, you know, you you have a, a very unique business in that you really wouldn't be selling cars out of there, but it really doesn't change the fact that you would have the license to change, to sell cars out of there with a class two license. And it just doesn't, I, you know, we have other areas in town that you, that I think would be better suited in, in other, you know, in more of a commercial areas to, to sell versus in the residential area. So I think you can still continue with your business as, as the zoning officer had mentioned that, that as far as I understand, you can operate a home-based business there because you're not bringing customers there and you're following all the rules of that home-based business, but we wouldn't then have to bless it with a class two license. The, res the restriction is uh, I'm not allowed to deal with the auctions. Uh, and as well as, uh, as a non-licensed business, you get hit with a sales tax on every vehicle you buy. So, at that point, it's really not a viable thing to do. Well, I, I still think then probably we'd have to set up in a different spot if you wanted to kind of carry on with that business. Um, I, I mean, I was, I was a little, little confused because you also said that your attorney said that they didn't have a problem with that. The attorney doesn't have an issue with a home business. Thing. Right. Us also then on top of that, giving a class two license to sell cars from there is 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 condoning selling doing a doing a, a, a car business in a residential area i just don't think it's an appropriate spot for it when we have other places in town that are appropriate for selling cars and again i understand your business is different because it's on the internet but it um but i'm also trying by the same time to minimize my my overhead to start this business that's the whole idea why i chose to deal with the internet instead of having to pay big money in rent. Yep, I, I understand that. Business is tough, really, you know, getting it off the ground and, you know, you have to lay out the money to do it. I just, I don't think it's appropriate for us to condone it, that business in a residential area with a class two license. Kevin, also, um, our building inspector alerted us that you pulled a building permit for a 30 by um, 90 foot building, I believe. No, not 90. 60. 60, 30 by 60. What, what was your, what were your intentions um, to use my, that for? My daughter has horses. I plan on storing hay, mowing equipment. I also own Corvettes. I plan on storing those in there. Um, it's not going to be even remotely related to an automotive business. I Great. wanted to clarify that. Oh, well, that's I, fine. I, I was alerted that this would come up today. So. Well, that's fine. That's fine. You're more than, more than welcome to do that. Well, I, I'm not in favor of this in the residential area either. And I, I really don't feel that we have staff to monitor the situation either. So um, I would so make a motion. First, well, first we'll make a motion to close the hearing. Yes. This has been a continued, continued hearing. Um, so I'll make a motion to close the hearing unless there's any other comments from the board. No, I will second that. All those in favor? Hi, Trevor McDaniel. Hi, Carolyn Ness. Hi, Dave Wolf. Then you will make a motion. And I will make the motion that um, we would not approve of this class two license. I'll second that. 
Could you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Okay. Uh, is my understanding that Phoebe is not going to be here tonight? You Correct. Um, she will not. Yeah. I, I would like to table um, her responses so I could respond to this. I, I Unless you want to talk about uh, the value of the square footage. Well, part of the issue is that we've been operating all year without a contract. So we're done. We don't have a contract. We don't have another year as of today. I thought we had a three year. We contract. don't because of COVID it, it expired last year and we've been operating all last year without a contract. So with that, if we don't approve this tonight, we have no thing. So I, I, I would make a motion to approve this contract and then negotiate for the year. If you want to do it for a year and then negotiate for the year, if you want to make some other changes, but I don't want to lose our, our well, public health, you know, Right. Service in the meantime. Um, Casey it. has we got a second. Yeah, I, I, I guess I just want to state that I think it's really important that we clarify that um, we include emergency response. What well, she did answer right? well, well, but in multiple public meetings, which are were taped, she had said that the health district does not is not a um, pub, does not respond. And that was what the tension was for the entire time. We wanted to set up, we were ready to go. You know, I organized our EDS calls, weekly EDS calls, all through the whole pandemic. We were ready to go when the vaccines came. There was notification that there was going to be a bottleneck that, you know, having someone be a vac only Lisa White being the vaccine manager for the entire county was going to be an issue. And Phoebe did not want to allow her to do it. And it Whoa. took multiple meetings of many meetings of the vaccine committee, the county vaccine committee to get her to be released to work as an emergency response. And that's how the FERCOG got involved. And then they, you know, I mean, it was a real hassle. It, I mean, so, it, it, a lot of this hassle came from the state. We've trained just so the public knows that we've yeah. been training constantly for year after year. We give up so many Saturdays and Thursday nights and drilling our EDS drill. And we run our flu clinics as a, as an emergency right. drill. If there's going to be a pandemic we want to be ready and as soon as the pandemic hit the state said mm, no thanks thanks for all your time we're not interested go to cvs and so that was a real slap in the face to everybody who stepped up volunteer i mean I, I look in the audience there's a lot of people that volunteered at those flu clinics a lot of people that worked hard to make sure the town was ready and had skill and volunteers to to give shots in the arms and and get our people vaccinated it was pulling teeth to try and get what we got going and it was because the state didn't want to didn't want to let it go well yes and no i mean jennifer Rem, uh jennifer um hoffman at greenfield's um health department called up john um ferguson at dph and said what do we have to fill out and she did get something going for first responders in the first time phoebe did not want us to do that we mm -hmm. were ready on multiple meetings i said we would be able to do that and step up to the plate. i do think a city is a little different than our town but i i, I agree i mean I'm we, had tree, not we had tree we had tree we had we were ready we had it go. all ready to go yes i'm not so disagreeing I, I need we need to make sure that Emergency response is included well, in our contract. We it need says to emergency response. It is our belief that the current contract makes it clear that you are purchasing the services of public health nurse who will, among other things, manage your communicable disease response work, including during emergencies. Emergency response is, in fact, so fundamental to the definition of the role of the public health nurse that we have not seen the need to make it even more explicit in the contract. We believe that this has. This past year um, is a good example of how that 
looks in terms of contact tracing, vaccination, participation, regional emergency response team meetings, creation of public communication material, pivoting nursing services to curbside, COVID safe and more. Um, however, we're happy to consider any proposed language. So if we want to put forward anything. I, I think that's critical. We have to add emergency response to the contract because it just says emergency planning if you read the contract. Second, the second thing was $4,800 for her the space here. Mm -hmm. The space for all the nursing programs are here and we get $4,800 for it credit. So if you add our 22000 that we pay and the $4,800, that's almost $27,000 that we pay for nursing services, and we get 10 to 2 um, well, on mean, Wednesdays and some outreach. This, when, this, when this started, when this started, we were, it was Conway, Deerfield, and another community, and we had eight hours a week. We have not had eight hours a week, you know, consistently for our seniors. And I, I feel that for that amount of money, that is a lot of money. Well, 27,000, I mean, if you're gonna hire a nurse on your own, you're not gonna get, I mean, what are the money, you, you spend a whole lot more than that to get a lot less of the, the back. We're talking back eight support. hours, we're talking, not getting our eight hours a week, Trevor, for that well, amount of money. Them for it. I mean, I, I am. There are 16 communities now, yeah. and there was one public health nurse. There's no well, way. They're not, they're not now. They have hired public they health They are nurses. in the process. They got a grant for a second nurse. So you're doubling right. the capacity. And the question was, how, are, how many hours are we going to get? And what is the reduced amount on our assessment? Because... That nurse is three is free for three years and renewable for two years, so that is free. So where is the reduction in our assessment? If this is you're doubling the capacity, what are our extra hours? What are what's the reduction in our assessment? Well, they're they're doubling the capacity for all the communities, right? So right, just it's, for Deerfield. But. Where is the reduction in the in our assessment to reflect that you're doubling the capacity, and we're still paying, but where 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 is our reduction because they were able to get this free public health nurse? I think they're going to expand services all over. I don't know why they would reduce our assessment. I mean, our our services aren't going down. Well, I want a guarantee of our time, and I feel like we should be able to get extra time with no additional costs Extra from what so. for this is they got a, a multi hundred thousand dollar grant to increase yeah. public nursing where is the reduction in our assessment trevor where uh, does I that think their grant is to to increase public nursing throughout the county not just in deerfield well in the I mean, 16 so communities I think you're mixing two different things no so no i don't know you how you're gonna you I mean, you still be my guest a ask for it i just my concern is that we don't we don't vote this tonight and we have no public nurse and we're out of a contract and we lose all the support that FERCOG has helped us throughout the last year and a half. I mean, it's not well, just this is new that I did not realize that our contract, I thought the three year. I did too. So this is new. No one told me that, that it was already extended a year. Well, we, you know, we've had this for a while and we keep pushing it off and pushing it off and we're at the last minute right now. So, well, there should be some reimbursement for when Lisa was acting as a vaccine manager for the entire county. The FERCAR charges $45 a shot. They gave over 10,000 10, shots. That's over $400,000. And, and, and I so so I Orange, Montague, all these towns that are not part of the health district were using our nurse. So her time should be we should get some kind of reimbursement so, when the money comes in. I think when the money comes in or before that, we go to the council and ask them for, for you make a proposal for what we think is right to have to come back from that money. Well, it should be at least a half a year it's services it's that the, the seniors did not receive because the town hall the, wasn't open. Well, I know they didn't receive those services. They received plenty of other services. We went through this, this, you I'm, know, this pandemic, but um, what I'm saying is if we want to make a proposal for money back to the town from the vaccination money, we should make that proposal to the council 
not to the nursing thing, but to the FERCOG council and say, this should be a reverse to our town because we, I mean, we stepped up with space for materials at the church. All the, all the vaccination materials came here. We unloaded them here. Of course, Lisa did as well, but I met the truck a few times myself and we've loaded that stuff. I was so at th- every single, every single clinic. We can, yeah. we can shoot down. I just don't want to conflate the two issues. I, I want to make sure that we're continuing on with nursing for our community. We have a foot clinic here tomorrow. Um, so I think yeah. it's important to continue that work, but also advocate to the well, council for, for the, the foot money. clinic doesn't have anything to do well, with nursing. What I'm saying is, but I, I just want to make sure I feel like we've been every time this contract comes up, it's a three year contract. Every time it comes up, I ask, I feel like we're getting overcharged. We're not receiving the hours. And it's, you know, and, and I, I, I get that. But what's okay. the alternative? The alternative is to say you need to make you have 16 towns. So if they say no, thank you. What's the alternative? And I mean, we, we still we, don't then have then a nurse and we're not we're, going to the foothills. We're not. I mean, I just want to make sure that we recognize we need another alternative. We walk away from this one. Well, but you've already shut down saying we have twenty two thousand dollars that we um, allocate plus the space. Correct. We certainly can attract eight hours of nursing from somewhere. But you're giving David. up all the other yeah. stuff. Go ahead. Um, Casey has her hand raised. Yeah. Go ahead, Casey. David, may I clarify something? Yeah. So the methodology to keep nursing services continuing as of July 1st is to approve this contract and immediately take a vote to notify the COG that we would be opting out of the contract in a year's time. That would allow us to preserve all the support for communicable disease, monitoring and vaccinations and all those things that we do get for services, including face-to-face services that the nurse provides for the next year to then have discussion How'd that go? with the COG. Anybody on the Zoom, if you could please mute. Thank you. Okay. I got and, you. For, okay, then that's fine. I I didn't realize that we had already extended a year. That that was not clear to us. We that's in our last meeting we said we'd automatically renew. So that the why that's why there was no rush. Yeah, and you know, it's more a, either. Uh, you know, last year we're buying a blur. Is a significant amount of money, but I don't want to take the chance of losing Lisa tomorrow. So I think you know we should at least extend for a year. Um, I don't know uh, how hard and fast that opt out would be in the year, but um, it should be subject to negotiation. I think that's fine. I just feel like we have been paying. Uh, an excessive amount of money for several, at least one contract renewal worth. And we, every time we go to discuss it um, and try to nail down the service hours, this is a, absolutely not a question of Lisa. We, we love Lisa. That's why we have stayed with the FERCOG. But um, and she totally services understand. 16 towns, and I know we're not getting our hours. There just physically is not enough time in the week. I just know last year, Lisa worked an immense amount of hours. I, I do, too. I do, too. But yeah. don't forget, we extra we paid extra money for that, that, too. But so it it just is not I'm, – I'm just – want to make sure that we the seniors are the ones that didn't get service from when our town hall was closed and i would like a reimbursement for that i also feel that um by getting more value for our for our office so the whole program can run out of then we can um offset that for a social worker you know the few hours we need for a social worker if we have more hours you know more credit on the square footage I, you know, the $4,800 is a year's rent for electricity, air conditioning, heat, phone, copying. I mean, that is a tremendous value. I, I don't feel like that's a real, I think it should be more, but 
we can discuss it. So, so I'll make a motion to continue with the contract. Here. Yeah. We have a second. Actually, we have that second already. Yes. yes. Sorry. So just go ahead and vote. It's fine. Um, do we want to put the opt out in the motion or no? I do not. I, I would like us to, to consider the opt out because that's I think that's the only way we're going to get them to the negotiating table. Why don't we say instead of opt out, say subject to negotiation in one year? That's fine. You okay with that language, Casey? So that was a motion to approve the contract and opt out and, and opt out subject to negotiations no. within one year? No, 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 we wouldn't opt out. We would negotiate. I think we approve the, I, I think we should approve the contract and make a motion to approve the contract and have that vote. Then a separate done with motion. That. Separate motion would be to, to enter into negotiations with Fer, FERCOG and the council to talk about the issues we have. Uh, presented by Carolyn tonight. Well, we need to do it in a timely manner because then we're locked in. We're going to be locked in for another three years if you yep. approve this contract. Right. And then we have no ability to talk about it for another three years. Casey's got her hand up. Casey. I have an option. Hold on. So perhaps you would make a motion to approve this contract and make a separate motion to notify the COG of the intent to end the contract in a year's time unless successful negotiation is completed but, around some of the issues that you have. Yep. How's that sound? That's excellent. Okay, with amending that, Trevor? I think we just, we should make a clean vote on the thing and then we, we always have, all you have to do is give a year's notice. So I don't think it should you be tied to into this. And, and Trevor, then we're locked in for another three years. This no, happened you can three all, years you can ago. Make that contract and all you have to do is tell them tomorrow you're looking to get out of the contract and you have a year. To you didn't get out read of the, the contract. contract. It's a three year contract with an opt out with an automatic renewal for another but year. But you also have the ability to get out of it at any time. If you, it takes a year to get out, you just have to notify them. I, I like, so then I like it for just a year then. And that's not what the con they won't agree to. That's not what the contract. I, I don't know what to do, Carolyn. I'm not looking to get out of this program. I think it, it serves our community very well and it has for a long time. I'm happy to go and negotiate um, on the uh, on trying to get some other compensation back here and there. But I, I, I think it's important to continue the program. So I'll just I'm, leave I'm not disagreeing, but I think Casey's solution is correct. That's actually the solution that fulfills the requirements of the contract. So two votes one to approve the contract, and then a separate vote to notify the FERCOG that we are opting out as of next year, unless we can come to some amenable agreement. Yes. That, that meets the needs of the town. Now, we don't necessarily need to say that language right there. That can be communicated via the letter that we would send to them, but two votes would be the key, the proper way to do this within the contract parameters. That's fine with me. Okay. On uh, Trevor's motion, any further discussion? Nope. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. Do you want to make a second motion? Okay, so can you make that? The, the motion is to notify them so that we are opting out unless we have su successful negotiations on the issues that we've raised. Is that correct? Is that what you said? I would say the motion would be to notify the COG that we will be discontinuing this contract service as of July 1st, 2022, unless agreement on some of the issues that have been communicated is completed. Satisfactorily. Satisfactorily, okay. Okay. I will make that motion. I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? 
Cool. Hi, Carolyn Ness. No. Dave, uh, Dave Wolfram. Opposed, Trevor. Trevor. Okay. So it's two, one. Motion is carried. Uh, while we're still talking about the FERCOG, uh, do we have to reappoint our representative to the FERCOG for the next year? I just received that. Yes, we do. The um, next meeting is July 15th for the council. So if we don't do it, I literally just received the email. We I could put it on the agenda for the next um, meeting, but we do have FY 2022 appointments on our agenda tonight. So it's for four committees. I think I sent David an email, but I printed out um, some information for the select board if they'd like me to give it to them right now. It's normally the chair takes it over, Dave. Okay. Um, but tre Trevor's it right now. Yeah, let's have a discussion on that. Uh, we have a meeting on the 11th. We can discuss yep. that. Yep. On next year. Is that okay, Casey? I thought the meeting on the 11th was supposed to be for, for priority. <laughs> It is. We also have a meeting on the 14th. Okay, we can do the 14th. Okay, I'll add it to the. Okay. Okay, the next thing is selectman reports and announcements. Um, uh, yes, I have one. I just want to say a shout out. Um, and thank you to Chief John Pachorek and uh, Sergeant Jen Bartek. They were absolutely fabulous today at the Municipal Mental Health Policing Initiative um, uh, Select Board Association Leadership Conference webinar today. Um, they did a fantastic job. They just discussed the CSO partnership. Um, they were just as professional as the Brook, Brookline Police Department um, that has been doing um, a lot of mental health response. They have 40 hours of training in their department and have a departmental policy. And they came across as very well organized and well spoken. But I was extremely proud. And um, I, it's just wonderful to see the wonderful job that um, our department does. Mm -hmm. It was very good. Um, I was really impressed. That's great. Good. Any other announcements? Trevor, anything? Nope. Oh. Not today. Okay. Um, consent agenda? Anything for us, Casey? Anything for the consent agenda? No. Okay. Sorry. Okay, the next one is uh, discussion decision items. Uh, fiscal year 2022 appointments. Do you have that list? You said you have four committees? Two for the Tritown Beach. Yeah. If you want me to read those. Yes. Um, so uh, uh, Patty Pyrog is um, willing to step up and serve to uh, the Tritown Beach uh, committee. And that would make a motion to appoint uh, Patty and also uh, Mary Jacobs, um, lives on North Hillside um, Road in South Deerfield, would also want to step up and represent Deerfield on the board. So I would make a motion to appoint Mary Jacobs and Patty Pyrog to the Tritown Beach Committee. And I will second that and say thank you very much for doing that. Yes, thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor? Hi, Carolyn Ness. Hi, Trevor McDaniel. Hi, Dave Wall. Were there other committees you said, Casey? Pardon? Any other, you said you had some other committees or no? That was just a Tritown and- Just Tritown. Okay. Okay, uh, the next one on the appointments is the uh, appointments for the ZBA. Make a motion to appoint David Potter and Adam Sokolowski to the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'll second that. 
Any discussion from the select board? No. Okay. All those in favor? Aye, Chair McDaniel. Aye, Dave Waltham. All those opposed? I'm, I'm going to abstain. Um, I really feel like we need to finish working on our and clarifying our code of conduct. And I agree that we have to do that, but I don't think it has any bearings on the current appointments. Yeah. But you're right, we do have to work on that and it's a very going to be a very essential part of the town of Deerfield. Yep. Okay, uh, next thing on the agenda, I just scrolled down all the way through, so get back. Probably gonna work on two different computers. I make a motion that we approve the Deerfield home rule petitions for legislative action. I didn't realize we were looking for another additional licenses. Is that the, right? uh, This is something that was started actually quite a while ago, but was never forwarded to the uh, state. Part of it is to uh, not additionally just liquor licenses, but it also uh, gives the town the ability to increase the number of uh, 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 retail places for marijuana if the town so chooses. I see. I think it's been four or five years right. in, the, in the process. Yeah. This is just one step. Yeah. Well, I'll second that motion. Any discussion? Trevor, second it. Okay. Uh, hearing none, uh, all those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. And you'll get that out to Natalie's uh, office? I will. Thank you. Do you have a clean copy, Casey, we could sign or? I will print it out for you. I was waiting for Corinne to give me any corrections she might have had. Okay. Okay, uh, the next thing is sewer abatements. I have the sewer policy. I don't I don't well, see the abatement. I've got we've got one here you can share. Okay. So just... this is um this is for the estate or the heirs of Chef Chester uh Coleco, I think it is. Okay. Um they had um the owners are deceased, the house has been vacant, but there was a a break in the pipe, I guess, over the winter and I don't know, they had 69,000 gallons of water but usage, but they weren't there, nobody was there. So it's it's just abating it down to the, um, you know, standard minimum usage charge for the building. Okay. So the uh, the amount uh, will be uh, abatement down to the minimum bill of $180. Um, and I will second that. The assessed amount was $1,092.28. The abatement is $912.28. Okay. Uh, any further I discussion will. on it? Yes, I second that. Yeah, I know. Any further discussion? Nope. No. I mean, it's clearly. Yeah. I mean, this is the water yeah. department notified us. So, yeah. yeah. Typically, what we do in that case. Yeah. Jennifer? Um, just make sure that you, if there's a line for all of you to sign it and then I'm off tomorrow on Friday. So if Casey can give that to Sarah. Okay. Yep. We'll take care of that. Thank you. I'll bring it out. Can I uh, um, authorize my stamp? The, I just put the sewer policy here because, uh, you know, um, we've been working on this a little bit for um, agricultural um, yeah. entities and um, Barbara took a look at it. It's just for us to kind of, I, I was hoping you would just take the week and look it over and see if sure. you see any other changes. We'd want to do that. And then we could vote it again in another meeting. Um, really just. Um, this is this is what we agreed. It is. As far as what I can say, it see is. that this is what we agreed. So. Right. Okay. Um, I just do thought have, maybe you'd take a have, week and look at it, see if there's anything that came up. It? Uh, we, we could, we could send it out there for sure. I, I I've guess, never seen it. I will pass it to you. So. Yeah. Yeah. This I, is the one that I gave you and you cleaned up and then I gave to Barb and she looked at it. She had some edits. So just kind of rolling around uh, to make sure everyone puts their eyes on it. Based on the 
uh, some of these um, policies have been challenged in the past, I would feel more comfortable if Lisa just sure. looks at it. Of course. So do you mind, Casey? Not at all. Okay. Okay, uh, mail. What do you have in the mail? Huh. It was not much in there, right? It was, uh... yeah. yeah, on the laptop, I could scroll through 40 pages to get down to it, so. You have a, um, a letter from OHI Engineering. It's completion and permanent solution, no condition statement. I read that. I think they cleaned up some old tanks that were in the ground and yeah, processed they pulled, the soil. Yeah, they pulled the tanks and yep. made sure the soil was clean. Okay. Um, the, are we filing this somewhere in case somebody wants information on this? We should have it filed. Yes. Sure, we where would you like file. it? Yeah. yeah. Um, it looks like I have the original copy. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. I think it was just a colored. Oh, okay. Colored copy. Um, just make sure the original gets filed in the um, our building inspector's office. This will be something that somebody would look for or require if there's a mortgage or financing or some issues with um, soil contamination related to that address. Okay. Yep. Sure. It's not the original's on my desk, so oh, okay. I'll do that on Monday. Guess, all right. Town, town administrator's report. So Did, well, there was one more piece of mail. Did oh, you want to no. talk about the corona the DLS bulletin? So DLS has provided, and they're doing this on a regular basis. They're providing updates on fiscal recovery for revenue loss and various other elements of ARPA. I've sent a couple of questions out to DLS. So this is one thing I just wanted you to have access to. There's more information online. But one thing that, that I wanted to use as a jumping off point from this particular notification is the fact that Treasury has not sent out guidance. And this is straight from Sean Cronin earlier this week. Treasury has not sent out guidance about how towns can go about obtaining the allocations that went to the non-functioning counties. So as soon as they do that, we'll discuss it. I'll, I'll push it forward for you to look at. Most of the time you guys get these DLS bulletins, but so if you don't get something, let me know because I get them on a regular basis. But as soon as we hear from Treasury how they're going to handle that, I'll let you know and we can talk about it. It should be about 900,000 sitting there pretty close to that for Deerfield. Um, so I don't remember the exact number, but Treasury's just taking their time parsing through it. Yep. I know Which means we, DLS gets lots of questions. Right. We're going to get directly about just under, well, right around 500,000, but um, there was 900, I think, that went to the county that we have to then get whenever they give us the guidance to get it. Exactly. Did I see oh, something? Anyone I know it's a lot of money. Any I did. Emails where they said they, they could use the ARPA funds for any unfunded uh, police mandates. Say that again, Dave. I thought I was reading where uh, they made a determination that we can't use any of those funds for unfunded mandates to uh, policing. That's my understanding, but we haven't explored a particular subject yet. Okay. Uh, so that, that's what I, that's what my understanding. Attend a webinar on, on what is eligible. And um, I did talk to Brenda about the calculation of lost revenue and it doesn't really seem, we really didn't lose that much in revenue right. on the whole. So it doesn't make sense to apply for that part of the money, but, uh, or to, to expend any of our money on that. Uh, but, there certainly is a lot of things for economic development that would qualify, and um, this would be matching funds for the Leary lot, I think. Well, I, when I talked to our auditor about this, he was the one that kind of chased down where the money went. Um, 
he had said he had cautioned he's been cautioning towns to be very careful about how you spend the money and like if you can lump it into one program that serves the whole community um because of the requirements and all the staff time needed to kind of manage all of that um he said infrastructure something like that like no, you're talking about economic development for for that benefits the whole community really um is an important way to spend the money so that you're not spending a ton of staff time on all the reporting requirements well and i also think it's important to do one one time projects because mm -hmm. this is one time money right so it shouldn't yeah. be it shouldn't be anything that we want to be not sustainable or right you know a repeating operational costs or anything like that yep for sure there was a um a res resignation yeah do you want me to yeah, you're going to do the town administrator's report. Yes. So we're, as you know, we're towards the end of the fiscal year. Today is the last day of the fiscal year. And so we've been working financial staff, staff that are paying, doing our payroll bills. We're all transitioning. And so we've been starting to pull together all the documentation to for our coordination of the carry through, carry forwards, encumbrances and transfers. I had a conversation with Brenda today. I know Skip Olmstead's in the audience. Um, we will get in touch with, she will contact Julie, the chair of the finance committee to set up a meeting for any of the transfers. I want the board to know that we would plan to have the board do them either on, I, on the 14th, if there's any transfer between appropriations. Okay. So HR is a is consuming a lot of time in here. And I just want people to understand that it takes me away from other tasks because it's very time sensitive. We're working on several things right now. Um, land and infrastructure updates. So we're working on the North Main Street recreational project. Oxford procurement. I have two questions for the board on that. Um, right now, we're working with Andrea Woods to complete the procurement documents. And based on conversations that you all had with finance committee, capital, yourselves, the best price condition seemed to be the most um, useful one. So right now that's how the RFP is written. But for the property use, does the select board want to restrict use of either par partial to per particular parameters. In other words, do you want to restrict something? We haven't done that in the past, but it's something that has to be identified in the RFP. Well, I mean- It's in an expedited permitting district, which has its own parameters. Yeah, I just feel like economic development is like the key to that whole thing. We need to get it back on the tax rolls. Uh, yeah. I'd rather. My recommendation is to not do that, to not restrict. Restrict? Well, what if a, yeah, you know, I a mean, nonprofit goes in and wants to put up a building? Right. I, I'm worried about that a little bit. Yes. I just want to make sure that I guess understand what you're asking and think about that a minute. I, I don't really want to restrict what goes in other than want, I want jobs and economic development. And I don't know how to, you know, it'd be, it'd be t difficult if, you know, nonprofit goes in. Not that we don't love nonprofits, but we have our fair share already. Um, and the whole idea is the property should be for economic development. Is that what you're asking? Like, do would we restrict it that way? Or I don't know what you mean. Really. You would restrict the use of the property or not. A specific industry or to uh, you could do that. just say it, it must be used for economic development we could do that i can confer with andrea about that and see if there's other details i need to ask you about but i would recommend that we not restrict it on the other hand i hear what you're saying so let yeah me shoot an email that's the only thing i'm concerned about yeah so that'd be great i'd love to know that answer okay um, also related to the Oxford procurement, we took a vote last year as to the disposition of the property. In other words, to give permission to dispose of the property. 
And I would just like the board to confirm that vote. Sure. I will make a motion to confirm that we would want to sell the property, uh, the Oxford Pickle property, remaining Oxford Pickle property. So I'll there's two parcels. Motion. Yes. That's two why parcels. I said remaining. Yeah. <laughs> Both of them. Yes. Any so I second that. Hearing none, all those in favor? Hi, Trevor McDaniel. Hi, Carolyn Ness. Okay, well, uh, Casey, when the RFP went out for pilot, if you look at that, I think we the way we worded it was so that there was a definite economic tax paying kind of business going in. But we also had the choice if you know the we wanted a good partner, someone that has you know providing good jobs, good paying jobs. So we I, I'm pretty sure there was wording in there that we could we had a choice on you know accepting or not accepting. Oh the bids. Okay, the let bids. me check the RFP and I'll just confirm that. Andrea did yeah. that RFP. I I think you should check it because, uh, I mean, we always had the same concerns. We want to make sure we had a desirable company that's going to be quiet, fit into the neighborhood, that kind of thing. Okay. So there are several other things working in terms of land and infrastructure. We have the wastewater treatment plant upgrades project phase one in process, and we do have updates that we're, we're receiving from Justin Skelly. So I'm gonna start pushing those out. And it may be that we consider, and Trevor, this is sort of a question directed to you, but also to the rest of the board. It may be that we want to produce those updates online so that people can check in on a regular basis. We receive them on Fridays. But we also have the old Deerfield piping project in its beginning phase, contractual phases. I will let you know we did receive approximately 200, so I think it was actually $270,000 from Deerfield Academy, so thank them very much um, towards the piping issues up in Old Deerfield. We are working on legislative collaborations to proceed with those three home rule petitions. It's quite a process, so the reason we needed to hear support letters is they just want to make sure or have support letters is the legislature just wants to make sure that the select board approves of this and, and wants to move forward of, with this. In terms of grant administration, as I mentioned earlier, we're at the end of the year. So there's a lot of grant reporting that's going on. Chris Curtis is, is marshalling massive efforts to do all that MVP work, but there's a lot of background work that's happening in here because we have to start doing our reimbursement requests based on his deliverable reports. So we'll be working a little more closely with him next week. Um, I've sent in our ADH self-evaluation and transition report for reimbursement, which is a $10,000, a little over $10,000 for some of the assistance we receive from GRLA and from the COG. We have finalization of the community compact grant. We are in the middle, have received provisional approval for $51,139 from FEMA for our first project request. Yay, finally. Our second project request, which was $41,455, is in the final review stage. As the meeting was starting, I got an email from Brian over at FEMA about that. And we are developing a third project request that we'll be discussing next week with the technical assistance consultant that we have before we submit that to Brian Contreras at MEMA, at MEMA. We're also working on CARES Act funding and learning, as I mentioned earlier, about our That so how much out of information has been very slow. Now that we have some information from FEMA, what is our balance of the CARES Act money? I don't have the balance right now. We haven't finished doing some of the adjustments. We are investigating a couple of the projects that we had put on hold that were supposed to be funded through CARES Act, like the inspections, um, the inspections permitting software, because we have to update all of our procurement information. Okay. And if you recall, that project was about $16,000. 
I just want to make sure that we spend the CARES Act money first yes. before we, we start in on the ARPA, because the ARPA has a, a longer time frame. The CARES right. money has to be spent by December 31st. And so if we get final approval for that $41,000, it may be worthwhile doing the website transition through CARES Act funds because they're here. It's an allowable expense. It satisfies remote participation needs. And it also would allow us to transition the website to a much more usable, hopefully friendly, I say that in air quotes, um, platform. And we had discussed it. I had asked for a capital request and then we transitioned it into the budget. It may be worthwhile to do it all in one shot. I've been investigating that with the vendor. But Lily, would you be <laughs> able to have some conversation with Jennifer and Casey on the use friendly user friendly website? I I can't think of a better person that knows the frustration of trying to work on that. Yeah. You know. <laughs> You know, to put multiple, I mean, what it is, is, we need tabs that people can find things on and that you can keep seasonal things uh, right up front, like the tick report or the mosquito reports or whatever we need, you know, and then you transition to other things, you know, COVID, the COVID count in the, in the fall or whatever. People just can't find the information and it's very frustrating. So. Thank you, Casey, to work with Lily. I will. Um, there's also a, some of the other general activities we're working on. We had been working, Christina got, as you all know, if you drove by, Christina got a tent for the senior picnic. And we did some um, fancy talking with Alan and Shirley and Lily up at Hilltown Tents in Asheville. And they are willing to extend the rental through October. Oh, fantastic. Good. Yeah, I sent an email out to you and to uh, several other people. I, you'll see it in your in your email boxes, but I thought that was great. We they were very accommodating. I can't say thank you enough to them. So we also have the environmental study that's going to start at the senior center, and that will be coordinated between Adam Lesko, who's the gentleman that runs the company, Jennifer, Christina. We'll we'll keep that moving and then we'll be reporting back to Richard and to the other members of the select board and to the boo and obviously Christina she's gonna she'll be involved as well um, the some of the activities that Jennifer's been working on is this hybrid meeting transition as you're experiencing now it's a bit of a challenge luckily we're not the only ones facing this but it may mean that we need to use some of our grant funds to facilitate some better communication. Um, we, as you, you all had approved some funding to deal with some of the sound issues in the main meeting room. So when Jennifer gets back from vacation, she's gonna be working on that. And the other thing that's been working in the background that kudos to Jennifer for, for really stepping up and handling this and working with the planning board is they updated the planning board handbook and there was such a, a responsiveness from them in terms of going through the documentation and you know working with Jennifer to, to make it an easy handbook to work with. So she'll be working with CBA about updating their information as well. But this was a good jumping off point for everyone to understand what needs to be in a handbook. So thank you to her and to the planning board for really pushing that forward. Um, we've been dealing with the website transition, questions about how, to fun how that would function the public records requests that are coming in. Um, we also have training going on in the background where we have HR training, this ARPA information. There's other STAM trainings that are going on and Maya trainings that we can, they're various subjects. Sometimes they're HR, sometimes they're risk management. Sometimes they're trainings that relate to activities in the DPW. So it, there's a lot in terms of also the grant information that's coming out because often we need DLS will send us these bulletins and then we need somebody to distill the language of the bulletin into layman's terms because it's very technical sometimes and thankfully we have a great accountant great auditor to help 
So that's some of what's going on right now. But for the foreseeable week or so, a little bit longer probably, we'll be dealing with the end of year transition and the board will be holding a meeting on the 11th to discuss priorities. So that's a conversation that some of this information will be brought to the table because some of these projects are very large projects, particularly as they relate to the, the common, the Leary lot, how we, how we deal with adding the complete streets element to all of that. And now with the information from the Senior Housing Ad Hoc Committee, that that's an element that will that will be part of that type of planning. I forget. Can you just check on the deadline for Mass Works projects? Um, we need to we need to probably put in a, um, a, um, some kind of application into the Mass Works for River Road. Um, that's going to be well over a million dollars, I think. Isn't that the kind of infrastructure project that Tom Scanlon had discussed with you, Trevor? Yes. Yes, yes. exactly. Yep. So for purposes um, we're not... of doing a one-time project, that's actually, that could be a good use of those ARPA funds. Then that will suck up everything. And I, there are uh, other fa uh, funding sources for that. But we might not have a choice if it collapses, the road collapses in the next couple of weeks. You never know. So yeah. I will talk to Kevin about that, but we're going to have to have a shovel ready project. I was talk on, on the 11th. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have to do some engineering on that. Yep. We'll show up. Um, so that's my. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, Jennifer, for all you're doing. I know it, it's a lot. It, I know, especially in this heat, <laughs> it's just been brutal. So, thank you. It's a lot going on. Um, Unanticipated resignation. Thank you, Michael. Was, um, do you want to just read that, David? Sure. Okay. So. Um, so we have a, a, a resignation from the um, Historical Commission. Um, let's see. Um, Michael um, Mullenberg has um, had to step away. He really enjoyed his time on the on the commission and learned a lot about the community and felt more connected to the community. So um, we have another opening. If anybody would like to serve on the um, Historical Commission, we'd love to um, hear from you. Please send in a letter to the select board. And we have the 350th that we're um, figuring out our events right now. And we have plenty of opportunities for anyone that's interested in the 350th committee as well. So, okay. Casey, do we, do we want to, in, uh, in this section, do we want to talk about uh, getting a, um, having the select board approve one of us to sign the anticipated agreement for that second contract for the piping project. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you. So we have two things play in play. We have the Franklin there's, so I mentioned yesterday that there's another phase of the repairs and replacement of the piping up in old Deerfield. And so we received more information, which is the notice of conditional approval for the project and then what was requested is a vote from the board authorizing a member of the select board to execute that upcoming contract sure. yeah. upon receipt and approval by council and under the recommendation of the engineering firm. So we have that and we also have um, the Franklin County Solid Waste Management MOU for sludge and hauling that came in after the agenda closed on Tuesday. Oh, I would and make that is time sensitive. I would make a motion to um, appoint Trevor to sign the contract for the piping project. I'll second that. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? I, Trevor McDaniel. I, Carolyn Ness. I, Dave Wolf. 
Um, Casey, I just had a question on the sludge uh, hauling uh, costs. W what did what, what was the um, um, expiring contract costs? I, I don't up. have that. I'm sorry, I forgot to ask Kevin that. I'm still here. I don't know if he's in the audience. No. Um, do you know if it uh, is more or less? I think it's less. Do you think it's slightly less? I think it's slightly less. I could be wrong about oh, that, yeah. but. Uh, it felt like it was stabilizing. I mean, signing the bills every two weeks, you know, they're just, they're the worst bill to sign. I know, I know. <laughs> it's, it's sending our stuff to Lowell, but they're the only facility that will take it. Um, uh, That's why I don't I was have wondering. it handy. I didn't, you know, this came up pretty quick, but um, it's something we have to move forward. I mean, yeah, I, I make a motion to um, sign that. FY22 MOU for sledge hauling and disposal. I mean, we don't have a choice. Sure. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Nope. All those in favor? Aye, Trevor McDaniel. Aye, Carolyn Ness. Aye, Dave Wolfram. These, these are identical, right? Um, it's like, where's Waldo? Can you find the difference? <laughs> I think they're identical, correct? I, I, think, I think that there's one because of the hauling and one because of the sludge, they're just both say it, you know, they'll go to two different departments. So they need the signatures. Yeah. I will sign them both. You know what I, I mean? Just... So, yeah. And can we approve using David's stamp on these? Sure. I make a motion um, to approve David's stamp. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? I cover McDaniel. I Carolyn Ness. I Dave Wolfman. I assume Kevin's probably got this material. He brought it in and recommend. Okay. He wouldn't be happy if he approved it without him knowing. Okay. Um, that is the end of our agenda. Did, did you get this? This was, um, I don't know if you got a copy of this that for a is going through the culverts. Yeah, they that was we 348 done, but we still have a lot more to go. Yeah. Um, so David, what they're talking about is the response from Megan Rhodes at, at the COG about the culvert study. Trevor asked me before the meeting, I emailed you, I forwarded the email from her to you, but I printed it out for the, for okay. Carolyn and Trevor. Okay. It looks like they're picking up pace after June 30th um, and they wrap up a bunch of grants. So they'll get the second half of the collection data. I've um, done 348 culverts so far. And there's a whole lot more to go. Yeah. Um, this was this was from the technical grant two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, just Casey, just make sure you it's on the tickler for um, on the fourteenth because uh, we need to figure out which ones they're supposed to prioritize them for us, but we we need to look at them and prioritize them ourselves if they don't so that um if they don't do that in a reasonable period of time because um this will be the infrastructure projects that will be eligible under any of these federal bill bills mm -hmm. that are moving forward so um w we got to be ready for this this is why i was um so cranky about making sure that this gets done because i mean these are millions and millions of dollars worth of work here yep i so they was it the, is it under the infrastructure bill that's moving forward in the federal government it's going to be it's definitely roads and you know bridges and that kind of thing and the culverts will qualify so we need to pick two or three critical culverts right away and get some engineering done get some pre-engineering done at least somebody look at them and give us a ballpark figure so that we could fill out the paperwork if necessary um it's going to 
whenever it gets approved, the infrastructure bill will, the applications will get filled up really fast. So we need to get, be ready to go on it. Um, we, we, ha we have, have the, engineering under the road, don't we? We have some preliminary in, uh, information on River Road, but that that is a we have to do bio bio, bio structure stabilization on that bank. Yeah. That's different than a culvert. Although if we put in a small bridge, it might qualify for a small bridge, and that. But I I agree with Kevin. I think it has more to do with the Connecticut River erosion versus runoff from the hill because it doesn't it doesn't track with the vents. We have more damage or more slippage um, when there when the river goes up and down versus coming you know intense events coming off the hillside there. Yeah. I agree. The pump stations have a great effect on the Connecticut River. Right. So but if we have if we have a, a significant storm, we we can. It looks like there's going to be more money in the emergency watershed protection program, and that's that's how we got repairs on Mill Village and by the sewer treatment plant in Old Deerfield, and that that is a really good program. We only have to come up with a match in the ballpark of thirty to forty percent, but we can come up with in kind. Um, match which makes you know m much less mm -hmm. so it's a very good um you know you work with the nrcs yeah. and and so you get pre-engineering um engineering design and the permitting so we don't actually have to incur all those costs so that's huge and that doesn't count as part of the um you know the the whole project it's just the um it's outside of of the implementation so and they then they will do that and that's huge because the permitting alone is going to you know you have to count at least 20 percent of the project costs so that could be a couple hundred thousand dollars yeah so if we can get help with that that's huge plus they oversee the implementation which Kevin would be thrilled about, you know, given their experience with co the culvert at um, Kelleher Drive, he would be thrilled that we don't have to worry about that. So. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I'll second that. Any further discussion? All those Robert in favor? McDaniel. Aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Dave Wolfram, aye.